It's always a huge honour and privilege to come and give a talk at this most prestigious venue and to have such a lovely, varied audience here. Um, and it's particularly lovely because it's a special kind of audience. It's the kind of audience that knows... Or, there'll be lots of familiarity with um, things like this, pie. I bet there's lots of people here who know what pie is. But even more than that, it's the kind of place where I bet there's one or two people who know quite a lot about Pi, and in fact would be able to show off just how much they know about Pi. So I thought I'd just start with a little contest to see if there's anyone who is able to beat my calculator by quoting Pi to more decimal places than it can. Do we have any Pi challengers in the room? Okay, got a. Uh, Let's just see if there's anyone upstairs as well. It's a bit hard to see with the lights. Right, I see you waving madly on the back row there, and thumbs up to me. So, here is your, your name is? Timo. Timo. Fantastic, Timo. Take it away. We're just going to have to try and remember what you say, but let's hear pi to as many digits as you can entertain us with. Go for it. OK, you've beaten my calculator. Give a round of applause. Wow, that is just unbelievable. I think you ran out after about 20 digits, and you could probably have gone all night, but we're going to talk about something else. Um, yeah, I mean, pi, of course, goes on for an infinite number of digits, and rather, there is no obvious pattern to it. So it, it, these are it's like random digits. So well done for memorizing. Um, for those of you who kind of want to maybe not match Timo's feet, but at least come somewhere close, um, there is a little thing you can show off for parties to show how much you've memorized pi to. Just memorize this sentence, may I have a large container of coffee? Okay, and what you have to do is just count how many letters there are in each word. Three, one, four, one, five, nine, two, six. Uh, and if you can remember that, you have memorized pi to seven decimal places, which frankly will impress most people. Um, so, uh, but pi of course has uh, some beautiful mathematical properties, but also it has a practical use when, with various real-world calculations like uh, things to do with circles and circular motion and so on. And actually, it turns out, when you're doing practical things with pi, uh, it's very rarely necessary to know pi to more than, or certainly to even that number of decimal places. In fact, for most purposes, that is all you need to know, 3.14. And weird and wonderful thing, I wonder if you've ever written pi like that and put it next to a mirror, because if you do, something really weird happens. Um, it says pi. <laughs> Just in case, you know, you've forgotten what pi is, keep writing numbers until it says pi in the mirror, and then, uh, and then you've remembered it. Um, so there we are. Um, and actually, uh, I think most people assume I'm a mathematician and that I studied maths and so on, but I actually studied engineering. That was my university degree. Um, and uh, we'd have used pi occasionally for some real-world applications. Um, but um, there was a joke that, that used to be told about how you tell the difference between a mathematician and an engineer. And the, the answer is you ask them what pi is, and a mathematician will say, oh, well, it's a transcendental number with an infinite number of digits with no pattern, starting 3.14 and goes on like that. And an engineer will say, um, well, it's about three, but let's call it 10 just to be on the safe side. <laughs> because if you're building a bridge, you want it to not fall down, and therefore you don't want to be right on the, on the edge. And it's in the spirit of that that I'm giving this evening's talk, because I'm very interested in the real-world applications of maths, which is, uh, when it comes to real-world, things get a lot more fuzzy. And in fact, my history is of, of, of writing about uh, real-world maths. First book I wrote with a friend of mine, Jeremy Windham, uh, called Why Do Buses Come in Threes? That's what kind of launched me into doing what I do now. Uh, and I wrote another book with Jeremy, How Long's a Piece of String? Um, a book called Maths for Mums and Dads for Parents, wanting to know how it's all maths is done these days. Why is it all different from when I was a kid? Um, and another one called How Many Socks Make a Pair, to which the answer is uh, not always two, as it turns out. <laughs> it's not quite as basic as that. Um, and my most recent book, around which this evening is themed, 
is called Maths on the Back of an Envelope. Uh, and in a way, of all the books I've written, this one is perhaps the closest to my heart because I do think this is such an important concept and skill. Now, for those of you too young to remember what envelopes are, because I know they are dying out, they're no longer included in the retail price index because they're so rare. But anyway, the, the, the idea is um, th this phrase is still in common use, especially amongst business people and often engineers and so on who will say, oh, I'm working out on the back of an envelope. You know, back of an envelope calculations suggest we're going to need to stock about a thousand of these in the shop um, in order. So the idea is it's rough estimates. Uh, being done to give you a feel for what the right answer is, and uh, often done on a scrag of paper and envelopes in my office. It's definitely still envelopes. Uh, just find any bit to scribble on um, to, to get a sense of what the right answer is. And perhaps the key thing here is that no calculator is involved, or at least a calculator might be involved, but not in the initial stages of working things out. Um, now, uh, let me give you one reason why I think this is such an important uh, concept for, for those who are studying maths at school but going on to something other than maths, whether it be business or, or engineering or lots of other uh, statistical basic, ba uh, based uh, subjects. Um, recently, I was very lucky to be invited to speak to a room full of uh, academics who were the heads of their departments in civil engineering. Um, so I thought I would use this opportunity to, to do a survey, just a hand survey, uh, to say, okay, you uh, have students coming into your first year who uh, will have had to study maths to get in to do engineering, amongst other things. Most, most university engineering courses require A-level maths, not all of them. But um, I wondered what they thought were the weaknesses in the maths students that came in. So here are the results of my survey. Uh, quite a few, maybe, what do you think, about 20% said geometry. Uh, algebra, maybe 30%. Modeling, the ability to take the real world and turn it into math so you can fix it, that was quite high, but it was not the top three. Here are the top three. Estimation, being able to roughly figure things out. Basic arithmetic, <laughs> like what is four times three, for example. And uh, dealing with imprecise problems. Now, what intrigues me is that those top three in that list are kind of what defines back of envelope maths. And I'm actually interested to know, there's a lovely diverse uh, uh, age range in here. Raise your hands if you're in primary school still. Okay, and just looking, there's quite a few of you still in primary school, which is fantastic. And you're having to do lots of arithmetic. When you get to year six, you'll be tested on lots of stuff to do with times tables and so on. Here is something that heads of maths in secondary schools tell me frequently, which is, your ability to do arithmetic when you leave primary school is better than people studying math in sixth form who leave with an A-level. Um, and why is this? Well, the key reason is you do loads of practice when you're in primary school, but by the time you get to age 16, all the exams are now, in pretty much every um, syllabus, uh, allow you to use a calculator, and that is what students do exclusively. And when you don't work things out in, with anything other than a calculator. After a while, you lose practice and you lose confidence and you start thinking, I better just remind myself what three times four is. So I, partly, I'm, I'm so delighted to have so many young people here because I just want to remind you, it is handy. It could well uh, turn out to be very handy to be able to still do your tables when you leave school. Now, it might begin to sound like I'm anti-calculator, and I'm not. I, I have a calculator and use one just as many people would. Thank goodness for the calculator. It has saved us so much time working things out. But there is perhaps a slight myth that calculators uh, are much quicker than doing things in, with another method. Um, and one uh, <laughs> example of this, I was uh, at a primary school not long ago talking to some of the administration staff. And so not teachers, but just, you know, uh, general members of the public who, uh, who work there. And I said, oh, how do you work things out? Oh, we tend to use a calculator. Um, and do you, are you always confident that the calculator has given you the right answer? And I got a really interesting response from a couple of them, which is, um, well, I tend to keep trying. And they use a principle known as the best of three. So if you get the same answer twice, then that's probably right. Um, so um, so it is actually quite common um, to, to, to see people 
do calculations again and again and again. Um, but in any case, actually, after school and university, most of us tend not to use calculators. We tend to use, anyone working in business and so on, you probably use a spreadsheet. That's the thing we use for at doing lots of adding up. And here's a spreadsheet from a company selling widgets of some kind. Um, and a classic spreadsheet, it's got uh, a series of sales, and then at the bottom, there is a total. Uh, and that total is as a result of a formula. And I'm sure you're all happy with this because the uh, spreadsheet has delivered the answer for us. Is anyone not happy with that? Oh, I've got a few. Oh, the Royal Institution, lots of people are not happy here. Um, anyone like to say why you're not happy? There was a, someone over... Yeah, well, they're basically not happy because it doesn't look like they add up. Okay, And perhaps you've worked out that they don't add up, you, do, use your, you might have added up the hundreds column, or you might have just rounded the numbers. I mean, the classic thing that you might do is say, let's call it 200, 100, let's ignore eight pounds, it's so small, 400, 100, 40. That's added to 378, 840. It's, it's looking too big. It's looking a lot too big. And in fact, it is, it is wrong. The calculation is wrong. But it's wrong for a very common, familiar reason. Um, the spreadsheet is, uh, the, the, here's the extra, it's column C and it's rows 3 to 8. And the formula has, uh, says the sum from C4 to C8. You notice the formula has forgotten to add in the number at the top. How has this happened? Probably because it happens to me all the time. You think, oh, here's all the figures. Oh, there's one more. I'll add in an extra row and put that in. But you forget to change the formula. And so uh, you end up with the wrong answer. Um, and you've probably all experienced that. But let me tell you something rather shocking. This isn't just common, it's almost all pervasive. I came across a statistic recently which said that 90% of all spreadsheets contain errors. So if yours is right, look at the four people either side of you. They've made some mess with their statistically. Um, and who knows this? How, where have they come up with this figure? Um, well, uh, the, the people responsible for this are known as the European Spreadsheet Risks Interest Group. <laughs> I, I'd like to thank my friend Matt Parker for alerting me to this. Uh, good on them, because they study this and they publish a whole list of horror stories, with mistakes made with, with spreadsheets. Companies saying we made a £10 million profit and then discovering due to a spreadsheet error, actually it was a £20 million loss, and they forgot to add in that row. So serious things happen. So there are some reasons to say we shouldn't necessarily trust calculators, however wonderful they are. And there's one other issue potentially with calculators, and uh, I'll link to it with a story, a story of a lovely natural history museum where there was a Tyrannosaurus Rex. And um, tourist was there thinking, oh, I'd love to know more about this. And went to the, uh, one of the guides and said, I'd like to know, how old is this T-Rex? And the guide said, uh, well, it's 64 million years and 23 days. <laughs> and the tourist said, that, that's incredible. How do you know it so precisely? And the guy said, well, when I started working here, it was 64 million years old, <laughs> and that was 23 days ago. <laughs> OK, now you can all see how stupid that is, but actually, it's a very widespread phenomenon known as spurious, well, we tend to call it spurious accuracy. We should really call it spurious precision. But, of course, it's not the, 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 the 23 days do not matter, because we've rounded this to the, to the million years. And one of the risks of calculators, what they brought to us, was the ability to produce as many decimal places as you want, as we saw with pi at the beginning, with the implication sometimes that, therefore, the answer is precise to that number of digits. And the truth is, real-world numbers are just not precise like that. You have to go into atomic physics, uh, physics and stuff to, to, uh, to be able to, to get m figures, in most cases, that you can trust to more than even three or four significant figures. So. Love calculators, though I do. For this talk, they are banned, OK? But what did we do before calculators? Well, I'd like to show you my dad's pocket calculator, uh, brought out of retirement, blown the dust off it, um, otherwise known as a slide rule. There we go. Who here has used a slide rule? Yeah, there's a certain age demographic in the room, I'm noticing. Yeah, um, basically, I, I actually I was in the very last year uh, doing my O-level. We were taught in my year 11 equivalent uh, how to use a slide rule. And then calculators came in, and we straight over. I used a calculator for my 
A-level. But um, I thought I'd give a chance for someone to have a go with this, with this calculator. Let me get it out. It really is a pocket one. It's a tiny one. So I need a volunteer to work out something really difficult for me. Uh, let's take, right, there's a girl there with a white top. Would you like to come down? And uh, I'm going to put the pocket calculator here. There we go. Give her a round of applause, please. Thank you. Hiya. What's your name? Laura. Laura. Fantastic. Laura. OK. Here is the pocket calculator. Now, have a look. I'm going to get my specs out. It's sufficiently small. I ought to be able to read the digits on this. Now, can you see? It's got loads of numbers on it. But the ones that really matter are these ones that down here. And can you see it says 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then 1 again, strangely. And then these very small numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That's actually 1.1, 1 1.2, 1.3. .1 OK, so we are going to use this bit of ancient technology to work out 2 times 3 and see if it works. OK, so um, to work out 2 times 3, can you see that's 2? I want you to slide this middle bar along. I'll hold it and slide the middle bar until it's the 1 is lined up with the 2. There we go. Excellent. Is it? Oh, perfect. OK, now what I want to do is to find, we go along here, and the green is pointing it, uh, it's pointing to three. Can you see that? So two times three. So can you move this little um, wire along here to three? And then can you read off what number, what number is it on, on the bottom line? Six. Six. Two times three is, it works. Round of applause. That's fantastic. You can go back to your seat. Brilliant. I mean, who, who needs a calculator when you can get an answer as fast as that to 2 times 3? OK, I'm taking the mick a bit. But, but actually, uh, you didn't tend to use the slide rule for 2 times 3, but you might have used it for working out 2.3 times 3.7. And to do that, exactly the same as Laura just did, you, move the, um, you, f you find 2.3 on the scale, move the middle scale along so the 1 is lined up with it, find 3.7 on the middle scale, and read off the answer there. And if you're really uh, good with lining up, you might be able to see it's 8.5 8 or a bit less than 8.5. It's roughly 8.5. That's what a slide rule would tell you. So slide rules couldn't give you numbers to large numbers of significant figures. It was a really massive slide rule. So you were having to round numbers. It, was just, it wasn't like they were teaching you how to do it. It was just a fact of life, which is why engineers tended to use it more often than pure mathematicians, perhaps. Um, but you would also use the slide rule to work out 23 times 371, because they're the same numbers. That's the really weird thing. So you had to know where the decimal point went. So in this case, 8,500. Um, and you would also use it for this calculation, 2.28 times 36.9. Going to round that, because you can't read off 2.28. 2.3 times 37. And again, you had to say, well, it's going to be about 2 times 30. It's going to be about 70, OK, 85. So that's how it worked. But what it meant was you were forced to learn about two really vital uh, things, how to round and how to know roughly where the decimal point goes. And these are very important skills in many professions, not least the medical profession. Let me tell you a rather horrible story from The Guardian a few years ago. Man died after nurse gave 10 times the correct level of blood pressure medication. After all, what's a decimal point? Well, it's a difference between life and death if you give someone 10 times too much. And you, can't, you can believe it when the pressure that medical staff are under, given all these calculations saying, you know, you need uh, 7 milligrams in a solution of whatever milliliters uh, for, per kilogram, of, and all these things to, to work out. If you don't sort of, can't step back and say roughly what figure we're going to need, you can do something really horrible with it. So um, I talked to a couple of doctors when researching the back of envelope book, and they said, under, as long as you don't reveal who we are, both of them admitted to having at some point in their life made a mistake uh, that was out by a factor of 10. In one case, the doctor actually then administered the drug and wondered why the patient was not getting better, turned out it was 10 times too little. So at least the decimal point had been moved in the right direction, and he made the correction later. But knowing where the decimal point goes is so important. Um, and then last week, here was a story. 
Johnson & Johnson ordered to pay man $8 billion over breast growth. So there, this is, a, a, I think, an autism drug. It was some kind of drug that Johnson & Johnson, massive uh, pharmaceutical company, had administered, and one man had discovered he was experiencing breast growth, very distressing and so on. He sued them, and the jury decided to penalize the company and award the man $8 billion. If you're not familiar with what $8 billion looks like, that's what it looks like. Um, uh, and the man is 26 years old. Let's suppose this 26-year-old goes on to live, as many of us hope we might, to 106 years old. Nice, easy number. Because that means he lives for another 80 years. So 8 billion in 80 years, uh, that works out at, I believe, $100 million per year. If we say there's about 300 days in a year, that'll do $300,000 per day. I think I wouldn't know how to spend $300,000 a day for one day, let alone for 10 days for the rest of my life. It's an obscene amount of money. And what he said in the story um, was, um, well, what, uh, a professor was commenting, and he said, well, what tends to happen is um, juries will sit around, and if they feel the, the company is guilty, they'll, they'll just pick a big number and put it out, and then leave the judge to make a decision and you know, work, do all the calculations. So you can imagine you know, the, the, the jurors sitting around there saying, right, OK, Johnson Johnson, we, we reckon they're guilty, so uh, anyone got a big number? Uh, eight billion? Yeah, that sounds big. Okay, eight billion it is. Uh, as long as it got Ilion on the end, we don't really care. But that was a very big Ilion. Um, so um, anyway, um, so we're, we're in the spirit now of estimating. So I'm going to give you a little quiz. Everyone can take part in this. Um, uh, first of all, this is Paul Sturgis. Last time I checked, he is Britain's tallest man. Okay, and. Uh, here is an actor. This is a photo taken a few years ago. Uh, some of you will recognize him, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Okay, so here's your little challenge. I want you to estimate how tall is Paul Sturgis and how much does Dwayne The Rock Johnson weigh? Okay, now before I reveal the answers, and I know how much excitement these answers will create, but before I do that, I'm just going to do a little survey, okay? First of all, when you were trying to picture the height of Paul Sturgis, I want you to raise your hand if you thought of a height in feet and inches. Let's have a look. OK, about 75, about three quarters of you have, uh, have estimated in feet and inches. Uh, the rest presumably in centimetres and metres, although there's no rule. You can use whatever, cubits or anything else. Um, and uh, for uh, Dwayne Johnson, how many of you have estimated his weight in stones and pounds or in pounds? OK, about... A third of you. OK. Um, let me just make a little interesting observation. Uh, it's 50 years since the UK went metric. <laughs> and the education system from 1971, I think, exclusively asked questions in metric. There is no GCSE paper, I think, that measures pound, uh, mentions pounds and stones uh, or uh, feet and inches. It's all metric. And yet, here we are, <coughs> an audience that's especially when it comes to height, dominated by feet and inches. Isn't that incredible? Um, and it's not just you. I mean, it's, it's actually everyone, and it's not an age thing. I've been doing a survey the last couple of years amongst 14, 15-year-olds, and the results are almost exactly the same. About three-quarters of them think of other people's height in feet and inches and think of other people's weight in stones and pounds, even though they don't necessarily know what a stone is, but they know what a person's stone is. Um, isn't that incredible? So the thought that, uh, that imperial units have gone away, it's, they clearly haven't. And why are we so imperial? Uh, well, it's partly because you don't learn measurements at school, by and large. Where you really learn them is culturally at home, from your parents, grandparents, and the environment around. So if you're reading, well, frankly, you, you, if anyone take a look at a, a weight loss magazine or anything like that, you know, it might say, lost two stone at Christmas. It'll rarely say kilograms. And I, in fact, I hear stories from nurses saying, well, I told the parents the baby is four kilograms, and they said, can you tell us what that is in real money, please? So, and, and parents, of course, would be in their 20s, 30s, typically. So, um, so there we are. I'll come back to why this is important in a moment, but I know you're dying for the answer, so let me just put you out of your misery. Paul Sturgis, according to the figures I saw, seven foot eight inches, 232 centimeters. Uh, <laughs> and... Um, and The Rock, in this photo, 18 stone 8, 260 pounds, 118 kilograms. OK. Um, 
So when I've been asking teenagers, I've said, oh, can, you submit your, can you submit your answers, please? And uh, just because I was interested to see you know, what kind of figures they came up with. Um, here's Holly's uh, entry. Uh, seven foot one, 16 stones, you've got an extra N in there. But, but actually, you know, those are, I think, pretty decent estimates. But notice what she's done. She's put a cross next to both of them. I am wrong because I didn't get exactly the right answer, and therefore I am wrong. And in a way, the maths system we are kind of trained into is one of exactly right or you're wrong. But of course, in these cases, it's kind of about right is what we're measuring. And there's good about right, and then there's quite a long way. Uh, from, from being right. So, um, so Holly wasn't wrong, and I, I think it's great, and maybe this is something that's best done out of school, to just encourage, yeah, that's a pretty good answer, that's quite close. Those, these are good ways to think about numbers, many of the numbers that we encounter in the real world. Um, here's another question that I like to ask teenagers, uh, and you can have a go at it first. How far is it, in miles, from uh, London to New York? One way of thinking about it, if you've ever flown from London to New York, you think, well, how fast does a plane go? 600 miles an hour, how long did it take? Six hours, all those kind of things. Anyway, you might come up with something close to what I believe is pretty much the right answer, 3,500 miles. What is that in kilometers? Well, some of you may be able to work, work that out. There's a ratio that I was taught which is 1.6, so 3.5 times 1.6, so, uh, oh, which is about 5,600 uh, uh, kilometers. Um, and I wanted to show you um, the, um, some of the estimates that, uh, that I had 15-year-olds coming up with, but uh, they, they came up with figures anywhere from 1,250 miles to 85,000 miles. Now, you may or may not think that is a, uh, a decent estimate, but when I asked for that miles to be turned into kilometers, the kind of answers that came up from about half of them were the one who said uh, 85,000 miles said 85.6 kilometers. The one who said 1250 miles, I think, said 12,500 kilometers. So lots of multiplying by 10 and dividing by 10 I think possibly because when we write miles, we shorten it to m. When we write kilometers, we put km. So there's this sense that maybe they're related, and you put k multiplied by 1,000, looks like it's too big. Let's call it 10 instead. Um, so it's very interesting, isn't it? You might understand a measure in one form, but not in another. And because we all travel to continental Europe, Miles have to convert to kilometers. These things are important. We can't avoid it. Converting from one, from one unit to another. If you go to America, which is an almost entirely imperial measurement country, they still do foot pounds as, as engineers. It's even more important. Um, so um, uh, let's think about that trip to continental Europe from the UK. And I'm going to show you a little a pattern of numbers. I'm sure some of you will recognize it, but you have to think what comes next. OK, one, one, two, three. 5, 8, 13, 21, what comes next? Let's get someone from upstairs, very back, shout out. 34. 34, what a fantastic answer. How did you come up with 34? That Fibonacci sequence where you take any pair of numbers and you add them up to get the next number. So each number is the sum of the previous two. So 3 plus 5 is 8. 5 plus 8 is 13, going further up, 13 plus 21 is 34. It's called the Fibonacci sequence, and it's a lovely thing, um, uh, which many of you might have encountered in, in talking about patterns of petals in flowers and so on. But uh, it's also got another thing that's slightly less well known, which is if you take two numbers in the Fibonacci sequence, the bigger one divided by the smaller one, 5 divided by 3, 1.66. Uh, 8 divided by 5, 1.6. 21 divided by 13, 1.615. The further along you go, the nearer it gets to a number that's very close to 1.618. And that number is also known as the golden ratio, deemed by some to be the ratio of the most beautiful, elegant rectangle there is. I'm skeptical about that part, but it is a lovely mathematical number. And it just turns out, just happens to be, that one, the golden ratio, 1.618, whatever, 
is closer to the correct conversion of kilometers to miles than 1.6 is, very, only very slightly. But it means that next time you're on the way to Madrid, you say, well, 21 kilometers, I can tell you what that is in miles, because 21 is a Fibonacci number, so it's 13 miles, and you would be correct to an accuracy of less than half a percent. It's amazingly accurate. Bad news if you're going to Toledo. Um, <laughs> or is it actually using only Fibonacci numbers? Can you work out how far, how many miles it is to Toledo, given that it's 50 kilometers? Remember, you can add up uh, various numbers. So I'll just give you a moment to see if you can. Okay, uh, let's take another answer from, well, so let's take an answer from at the back here or somewhere here. Uh, go on, sir, you're dying to tell me. 31. I would agree with you, 31. Uh, there's lots of ways you could have done it. I'll show you how I did it. might be the same as, as you did, actually. Um, I found three numbers that add up to 50, 34, and 8 and 8 twice. And then to work out uh, kilometers, just move everything along by 1. 21 plus 5 plus 5 is 31. Turns out, again, we're, it's incredibly close. It's less than 1% accurate, uh, accuracy, so, uh, or, or inaccuracy. So 31 kilometers. So there we are. I know for most of you, this might just be a little uh, curiosity, but there will be a few who are now dying to memorize the Fibonacci sequence so that next time overseas you can play the game of using Fibonacci. I could work out without a calculator how far it is in miles based on any sign that you see. But actually, let's get back to what most of us are likely to do, which is to want to work it out reasonably uh, uh, accurately, but we don't have to be exactly right. Um, I, uh, I'm going to show you this. When I was a kid, when things went metric, actually, uh, Kellogg's Corn Flakes were encouraging people to learn how to convert. I wish we should probably re reintroduce this, but there were three mnemonics, memory aids, that they published on the back of Kellogg's Corn Flakes packets. Two and a quarter pounds of jam weigh about a kilogram. Anyone else remember that? I've never forgotten that. <laughs> I was very impressionable. Uh, here was another one. A litre of water's a pint and three quarters. There we go. That's what a pint and three quarters. I measured that out last night, that photograph. Um, and finally, a metre measures three foot three. It's longer than a yard, you see. So there we are, 39 inches in a metre. Um, if you want to be a bit rougher about it, you can say, well, um, kilograms to pounds, roughly double. Litres, roughly double to get pints. And metres to feet, roughly treble. I still do that. If I see a mountain is a thousand metres high, I... I get a sense of a mountain better if I know what it is in feet. So I'd say it's about a 3,000-foot mountain. Okay, that's quite a serious mountain. Um, and actually, these kind of conversions, uh, there's lots of situations, especially if you go to America, where you might want to make conversions of this kind. Uh, here's uh, some of them. So miles to kilometers, it's pretty close to 1.6 inches, centimeters, miles per hour to meters per second. There's an interesting one, Celsius to Fahrenheit. Okay, the USA is entirely Fahrenheit, but some people, including me, are weirdly, perversely bilingual. Cold temperatures, when it's winter, I think in Celsius, oh, it's zero degrees, it's minus two. When it's really hot, I think in Fahrenheit, it's like 100 degrees, that's really hot. Is anyone else who's been, there's some cutoff point in the middle, like 65 degrees or something, where I flip from one to the other. Goodness knows why, but anyway. Um, so, um, so there's what the conversions are like. They're all pretty messy. You'd probably use a calculator, because life's too short, unless you're very good at you know, double and add 10%. But roughly speaking, double, 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 double plus 30, double and the same. Yeah, meters and yards, roughly the same. I kind of wish that that was something you did have to learn and just get drilled into you, just to say, OK, so it's 45 kilograms. Look, I'm going to start saying it's 90 pounds. It's, it's that sort of order. And that, I think, is quite useful. And I think the ability to double, actually, is a mental skill. It is worth practicing, because it pays back in so many different ways. You want to multiply something by 4, you double it twice. You want to multiply something by 8, you double it 
three times. And so if you practice doubling, you can double, double again. Uh, my youngest child loves doubling. She keeps on doubling until she falls asleep. So uh, I, I'm very happy about that. Uh, and uh, what about if you want to divide by five? Because there's five of you at a restaurant, and you say, well, split it five ways. What's that got to do with doubling? Well, I'll tell you what I do on those joyful evenings when there's exactly five of us. I double and divide by ten. Same thing. And these little tricks just can make hard things much easier. So 1, 20, 1 2, 3, 4 divided by 5 feels quite hard, mental long division or whatever, short division. But no, double it, 2, 4, 6, 8, divided by 10, 246.8. So for those of you who like playing mind games, it's some very valuable ones. And just occasionally, a bit of mental arithmetic can pay off. Uh, and one of my favorite examples of this was an episode about 10 years ago of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Uh, a couple was in there, and to set the mood, I'll play the music, and, uh, and then I'll tell you what que what, where they're up to and what their question was. Here we go. Okay, so the couple had made it to £16,000. This is pre-Jeremy Clarkson days. Um, and uh, so next, 32,000 was a safe uh, lifeline, you know, it was a, a, a safe number to get to, safety net. Uh, they'd used two lifelines, 50-50 and phone a friend. So there was only one lifeline left, ask the audience, when they were asked this question. I'm going to ask the audience, so since you don't have little keypads, I'm going to have to get you to vote with your hands instead. So... Um, uh, a, B, C, or D, pick one of those answers, uh, and I'll see how, where, where the audience vote is. Okay, so, if you think the answer is A, the Arctic Ocean, raise your hand. Okay. Uh, if you think it's B, the Atlantic Ocean, C, the Indian Ocean, and D, the Pacific Ocean. Right, computer, please add up those answers. Okay. It's amazing what technology will do these days. Actually, so that's what, the, uh, that's what the studio audience did, and that's very close to what you just did. And there's actually a little rule of thumb. If you do ever go on to Who Wants to Be a Millionaire and sit in the chair uh, and you've got to ask the audience, if the audience's answer, the peak answer, is lower than 75%, it probably means they're guessing, and I wouldn't trust them if I was you. And that's exactly what this, this couple did. They said, we'll take the money, and off they went. And that, that could have been the end of it. But a friend of mine, John Haig, who uh, just retired from Sussex University, but loves millionaire and loves uh, back of envelope maths, rang me up after the program and said, did you see that episode? They walked away with 16,000. I could have got them to 32,000. Um, and let me tell you how I did it. So to do it, you do need a little bit of general knowledge. General knowledge is handy, a bit of few facts, key facts about the world to be able to anchor your calculations. So it's handy to know that the Atlantic Ocean is the one between us and America, and uh, it's quite big, but actually it's a funny shape, isn't it? But a classic way of solving a problem like this is to say, let's make it simpler, let's call it a rectangle. Uh, and the question is, how big is that rectangle? Now, how far is that rectangle across? Funny enough, we came up with, we had that question a bit earlier on, which uh, was, uh, we were saying sort of three and a half thousand, let's call it 3,000 miles, nice easy number. How high is that rectangle? Yeah, you've probably got a sense. Well, we know it's like 12,000 miles to New Zealand. That's as far as you can go. It's not all the way around the world. So should we call it 10,000? That'll do something like that. So what's the area of the Atlantic? Well, of course, this is a thing where you would naturally be inclined to take out a calculator, but I don't think they're allowed to do that on a Millionaire, in case you can be looking up something as well. So 3,000 times 10,000. Well, actually, th there are various ways you can do, a, do this, and, and scientists probably have... a way of using standard form and so on. Or you can just say, look, I know my times tables, so I'll do, I'll do what I do, which is three times one is three, and then count how many zeros there are. There are seven zeros. So it's three followed by seven zeros. In other words, 30 million. There's a quick back-of-envelope estimate of the size of the, of the Atlantic Ocean. Now, remember, the question was, which ocean has an area of 4.7 million? That's about 10 times smaller. We're not out by that that much. So it's not the Atlantic. That's too big a number for four. So, okay, what about the Indian Ocean? Now, the Indian Ocean uh, is a lot bigger than people often think. It's actually because it goes right the way down uh, uh, to the, the Antarctic and, and, and spreads quite a long way. So it's actually not that much smaller than the Atlantic. 
And as for the Pacific, well, of course, it's massive. It's far bigger. And that only leaves one ocean that's small enough to be 4.7 million square miles, which is the Arctic, which was the correct answer. Well done to those of you who said the, uh, the Arctic. Um, and that's what John came up with. And that would have earned you £16,000. And it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Here we are working out uh, what the area means. And, and, well, first of all, why do most people vote for the Pacific? I think, or I don't know, it's probably something to do with this. Look, the Pacific is really, really big. And 4.7 million is also really, really big. So it's probably going to be that. But there's a really important thing for everyone to appreciate, especially if you're still at school and you're learning about numbers, which is there is a huge difference between really big and really, really big and really, really, really big. Just because it ends in alien doesn't mean a trillion is like a million. But the government and people like that are very happy for you to think when they'll just put alien on the end and it sounds impressive. Um, so, um, but how do we begin to get a grasp of numbers like this? Um, and, and sometimes with real world uh, consequences, 65 square kilometers. Here's a smaller area, but this actually was a true story from um, my laptop playing up. This is a true story from uh, a few years ago. The Somerset Levels flooded this patch of Western England, and uh, 65 square kilometers were flooded, and uh, the government announced they were going to pump out water. It's very hard for me to picture how big 65 square kilometers is, but what the government said they were going to do was pump out 1 million tons per day, which is great PR, sounds like a lot, but actually from an engineering point of view, is that a lot or not? And to uh, figure it out, Back of envelope is great for this, but how big is 65 square kilometers? Well, if you think of it as a square, what's the square root of 65, roughly? Yeah, because yeah, 8 eighths are 64, so that'll do, won't it? So let, let's picture a square that's 8 kilometers. Now, I find that easier to picture, about 5 miles by 5 miles. Okay, so from here to wherever in South London. Okay, I can picture how big that is, and that's 64 million square meters. And let's suppose the water was a meter deep. So 64 million cubic meters. And a cubic meter, fortunately, is a ton in water. That's the way a ton of water is defined. So basically, the, we were hearing about a 1 64th um, of a meter being pumped out per day, two centimeters. So I suspect the pumping out of a million uh, uh, tons a day was only a small part. Most of the solution was the water flowing away and oozing into the ground. But engineers need to know that kind of thing to say, look, is this just PR or does it actually work? Um, and to do that, you're looking for little nifty mental tricks. Working out the square root in your head, well, if ever there was something that people would say, oh, I'd use a calculator for that, um, it's things like approximate the square root. So let me just tell you, if you're curious, how you could work this out. And I, I bet some of you can already do this. But for those who can't, let's take a number like 937. Reach for a calculator. No, don't do that. Let's say, um, let, what, what you do is take the number, divide it up into pairs of digits from the right. So 37, then 9. Replace everything except the first pair or the first digit with zeros. Square root of 9 is 3. So the, the square root is roughly 30. OK, what about a harder number? Like, what about a harder number such as... 478,266. Okay, and you wouldn't dream of working this out normally. You just go straight to a calculator. But actually, same rule. Pair the numbers off. Replace all of them with zeros. The square root of 47 is roughly what? Seven. Seven times of 49. That'll do. Seven, zero, zero, 700. Close enough. We've just done a big calculation mentally just like that. As long as you don't mind about being spot on and precise. Um, and 4.7 million, now I did this animation just before, so I hope this works. That was the area of this ocean we were talking about. Again, same thing, pair them off and replace with zeros. Square root of four is two, 2,000. So now we're thinking about 2,000 by 2,000 miles. Okay, actually, hmm, the Atlantic's bigger than that, isn't it? So there we are. Um, back of envelope, square root. And uh, I do occasionally use that, especially when I'm hearing about areas. The area of this flat is 970 square feet. Well, what is that? I can't picture that square root of that. Okay, 30 by 30. Now I can picture what that is. 
Um, and uh, these kind of problems, they can be both mind little mental games to keep your brain exercised, but there are times in certain professions where they are just invaluable, where you can hear a number and very quickly just respond to it and say, that makes sense or that doesn't make sense. Um, I'd like to finish with uh, one of my favorite examples of this sort of back of envelope thing. I'm often asked um, onto radio programs to answer questions along the line of, Oh, this amazing coincidence has happened. What are the chances? So let me give you my favorite example of all, which is one of four of my favorites that are in the envelope book. And this is a story uh, of Wenda Douthwaite and her four friends. Here they are. I don't know their names, so I'm going to call them Alf, Bert, and Charlie uh, from, uh, from the left. And this was in 2011. And um, what happened was they were playing a game of whist where you take a pack of cards, shuffle it, deal out all the cards, and to their utter surprise and amazement, Alf was dealt all of the hearts, Wenda got all of the spades, Bert got the diamonds, and uh, Charlie got all of the clubs. Wenda professed herself to be gobsmacked, with good reason, because the chance of this happening, you can work out the maths, a randomly shuffled pack, it's right, difficult maths, but I believe the correct figure is the odds were roughly two octillion, 235, septillion, 197, hexillion, 406, pentillion-ish to one against. Very unlikely. But the thing is, how unlikely? Well, here's how you might do it, back of envelope style. You'd say, OK, 7 billion people on the planet-ish. Let's give everyone a pack of cards. And let's say, right, your job is to shuffle these cards and deal them out. And let's say you manage 60 deals per hour, and we'll let everyone in the world, in the world do this for 15 hours a day and give nine hours rest and relaxation. Okay, so we're all going to be involved in this exercise to save the planet or something. Um, and uh, anyway, it turns out it's going to take one trillion years if you, if you do the math. That is a long time. In fact, I think it's safe to say we will never see this. The, the, the odds suggest we will never see this happen again because mankind will all, you know, the planet will not be around by then. And it probably, you'd think, has never happened before, which is really odd. Because in 1998, exactly the same thing happened to Hilda Golding of Suffolk. And it also happened in 1978 in Milwaukee, 1963 in Wyoming, Vancouver, Bon. And also in 1959 at the St. James Club in London on April the 1st. <laughs> OK, what is going on here? The answer is, what is going on is perhaps we should start looking for other explanations other than chance. Now, April the 1st, could be there's someone who worked at that old people's home, if that's where they were, um, and thought, I could pull off the greatest uh, practical joke ever and just switch the pattern. I mean, it's easy to do, and I know uh, a few practical jokey magician types who would love to do a thing like that. Um, but there's another explanation, and the clue is... Um, in what Wenda said when describing that evening, she said the cards were shuffled, cut and dealt as normal, but that was the only thing that was normal. And it was the first game of the night as well. That's interesting, first game of the night. Now, I wonder if any of you has ever bought a pack of cards like I did this evening. When they're brand new, I'm going to take off the wrapping, and I hope this, this works. Um, OK, and take this out, take it out the wrapping. Thing is, when you take off the joker, Got all the spades, all the diamonds, all the clubs, and all the hearts. But of course, now they get shuffled. I'm going to show you the work of Kevin Houston of Leeds University. You find this video on YouTube. Kevin is going to do a perfect riffle shuffle. What he does is takes this brand new pack, uh, which is nice and stiff, and uh, they're easier to riffle when they're nice and stiff. He has learned how to find the midpoint of this pack cut it exactly in half, and you might think he's now going to go like that with them all over the place, but no, it's a much more finessed action than that. You just push them again. There we are. That's it. Isn't it beautiful to watch? And now that's the nice little shower he does at the end of it. Now let's look through. Ace-ace, two-two. Well, this is still not going to deliver what we saw that foursome see in terms of the cards, but now... 
Kevin is about to do it again. In the video on YouTube, he's talking as he does this, but uh, I'm just showing you the pictures, which are stunning in their own right. Uh, and um, here he's found the midpoint again. You've got to do another riffle shuffle, but by pressing them against. And he actually, in this video, I think, does it eight times in a row to perfection. Eight is enough to restore the pack exactly to how it was at the beginning. But look, spade, heart, club, diamond, spade, heart, club, diamond. You deal those out now, one player's got to get all the spades hard. If you say, hang on a sec, but she said they cut the pack. Well, if you've ever done it, you cut the pack, put it back. It does change who gets which card first, but you would still end up with all of the spades, all the hearts dealt out. So it doesn't change the, the way they divide between floors. So I'm not saying that's what happened, but I am saying it could have happened. And it's a darn sight more likely than eight or whatever it was octillion to one against. So sometimes when really, really amazing coincidences happen, th coincidences that are so unbelievable they're never going to happen again in the history of the planet or the future of the planet, sometimes it's good to say perhaps probability is no longer at work here. There's something else. And I need to have a sense of numbers to know when I should no longer trust what I've just seen. Um, and I'll give you an example. Let's suppose I were to toss a coin 10 times and it came up heads every time. I'd say, wow, that's amazing. What's the chance the next coin will be a head? And the answer is 50-50. Yeah, exactly, 50-50. It's just... But if I were to toss that coin 100 times and it came up a head every time, well, I don't know about you, but what I would think was, what's it going to be next time? It's going to be a head because I'm now beginning to no longer believe this is a random coin. It's someone who flips a coin exactly the same way every time, which does happen, or it's a double-headed coin, or I've been hypnotized into believing everything's a head. Various other explanations come into play. So even with the most interesting side of mass and coincidences and so on, sometimes um, back of envelope mass can just help you to make a sense and say, is this amazing or actually uh, should I be applying scientific principles and think about other explanations instead.